Haywood Woody Allen, born Alan Stewart Konigsberg, December 1, 1935, is an American actor, comedian, filmmaker and playwright, whose career spans more than five decades. He worked as a comedy writer in the 1950s, writing jokes and scripts for television and publishing several books of short humor pieces. In the early 1960s, Allen began performing as a stand-up comedian, emphasizing monologues rather than traditional jokes. As a comedian, he developed the persona of an insecure, intellectual, fretful, which he made Maintains is quite different from his real-life personality. In 2004, Comedy Central ranked Allen in fourth place on a list of the 100 greatest stand-up comedians, while a UK survey ranked Allen as the third greatest comedian. By the mid-1960s Allen was writing and directing films, first specializing in slapstick comedies before moving into dramatic material influenced by European art cinema during the 1970s, and alternating between comedies and dramas to the present. He is often identified as part of the new Hollywood wave of film makers of the mid-1960s to late 1970s. Allen often stars in his films, typically in the persona he developed as a stand-up. Some best known of his over 40 films are Annie Hall, 1977, Manhattan, 1979, and Hannah and Her Sisters, 1986, although he considers Stardust Memories, 1980, The Purple Rose of Cairo, 1985, and Match Point, 2005, to be his best films. Critic Roger Ebert described Allen as a treasure of the cinema. Allen has won four Academy Awards, three for Best Original Screenplay and one for Best Director, Annie Hall. He has also won nine British Academy of Film and Television Arts Awards. His screenplay for Annie Hall was named the funniest screenplay by the Writers Guild of America in its list of the 101 funniest screenplays. Allen performs regularly as a jazz clarinetist at small venues in Manhattan. In 2011, PBS televised the film biography, Woody Allen, a documentary, on the American Masters TV series, Early Life. Allen was born Allen Stewart Konigsberg in the Bronx, and was raised in Brooklyn, New York, the son of Nettie, born Cherry, November 8, 1906, January 27, 2002, a bookkeeper at her family's delicatessen, and Martin Konigsberg, December 25, 1900, January 8, 2001, a jewelry engraver and waiter. His family was Jewish, his grandparents immigrated from Russia and Austria. Austria, and spoke Yiddish, Hebrew, and German. His parents were both born and raised on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Allen has a sister, Letty, who was born in 1943. They were raised in Midwood, Brooklyn. His childhood was not particularly happy, his parents did not get along, and he had a rocky relationship with his stern, temperamental mother. Allen spoke German quite a bit in his early years. He would later joke that when he was young he was often sent to interfaith summer camps, where he was savagely beaten by children of all races and creeds. While attending Hebrew school for eight years, he went to public school 99, now the Isaac Asimov School for Science and Literature, and to Midwood High School. At that time, he lived in an apartment at 968 East 14th Street. Unlike his comic persona, he was more interested in baseball than school and his strong arms ensured he was first to be picked for a team. He impressed students with his extraordinary talent at card and magic tricks. To raise money he wrote jokes, or gags, for agent David O. Alber, who sold them to newspaper columnists. At the age of 17, he he legally changed his name to Haywood Allen and later began to call himself Woody Allen. According to Allen, his first published joke read, Woody Allen says he ate at a restaurant that had OPS prices, over people's salaries. He was then earning more than both parents combined. After high school, he attended New York University, studying communication and film, before dropping after failing the course motion picture production. He later briefly attended City College of New York and soon flunked out. Later, he learned via self-study rather than in the classroom. He eventually taught at the new school. He also studied with writing teacher Lajos Egri. His status before the selective service system was 4F, a medical deferment, although he later claimed his actual status was 4P, hostage, career, comedy writer. Allen began writing short jokes when he was 15, and the following year began sending them to various Broadway writers to see if they'd be interested in buying any. He also began going by the name Woody Allen. One of those writers was Abe Burroughs, co-author of Guys and Dolls, who wrote, Wow, his stuff was dazzling. Burroughs then wrote Allen letters of introduction to Sid Caesar, Phil Silvers, and Peter Lind Hayes, who immediately sent Allen a check for just the jokes Burroughs included as samples. As a result of the jokes Allen mailed to various writers, he was invited, then age 19 
to join the NBC Writers Development Program in 1955, followed by a job on the NBC Comedy Hour in Los Angeles. He was later hired as a full-time writer for humorist Herb Schreiner, initially earning $25 a week. He began writing scripts for The Ed Sullivan Show, The Tonight Show, specials for Sid Caesar Post Caesar's Hour, 1954-1957, and other television shows. By the time he was working for Caesar, he was earning $1,500 a week. With Caesar, he worked alongside Danny Simon, whom Alan credits for helping form his writing style. In 1962 alone he estimated that he wrote 20,000 jokes for various comics. Alan also wrote for the Candid Camera television show, and appeared in some episodes. Along with that show, he wrote jokes for the Buddy Hackett sitcom Stanley and the Pat Boone Show. And in 1958 he co-wrote a few Sid Caesar specials with Larry Gelbart. After writing for many of television's leading comedians and comedy shows, Alan was gaining the reputation for being a genius, says composer Mary Rogers. When given an assignment for a show he would leave and come back the next day with reams of paper, according to producer Max Liebman. Similarly, after writing for Bob Hope, Hope called him half a genius. His daily writing routine could go as long as 15 hours, and he could focus and write anywhere necessary. Dick Cavett was amazed at Alan's capacity to write. He can go to a typewriter after breakfast and sit there until the sun sets and his head is pounding, interrupting work only for coffee and a brief walk, and then spend the whole evening working. When Alan wrote for other comedians, they would use 8 out of 10 of his jokes. When he began performing as a stand-up, he was much more selective, typically using only 1 out of 10 jokes. He estimated that to prepare for a 30-minute show, he spent 6 months of intensive writing. He enjoyed writing, however, despite the work, nothing makes me happier than to tear open a ream of paper, and I can't wait to fill it. I love to do it. Alan started writing short stories and cartoon captions for magazines such as The New Yorker. He was inspired by the tradition of New Yorker humorists S. J. Perelman, George S. Kaufman, Robert Benchley and Max Schulman, whose material he modernized. Allen has published four collections of his short pieces and plays. These are getting even, without feathers, side effects and mere anarchy. His early comic fiction was heavily influenced by the zany, pun-ridden humor of S.J. Perelman. In 2010, Allen released digital spoken word versions of his four books, in which he reads 73 short story selections from his work and for which he was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Spoken Word Album. Stand-up comedian. From 1960 to 1969, Allen performed as a stand-up comedian to supplement his comedy writing. His contemporaries during those years included Lenny Bruce, Shelley Berman, the team of Mike Nichols and Elaine May, and Mort Saul, his personal favorite. Comedy historian and Gerald Nackman notes that Allen, while not the first to do stand-up, would eventually have greater impact than all the others in the 1960s, and would redefine the meaning of stand-up comedy. He helped turn it into biting, brutally honest satirical commentary on the cultural and psychological tenor of the times. After Allen was taken under the wing of his new manager, Jack Rollins, who had recently discovered Nichols and May, Rollins suggested he perform his written jokes as a stand-up. Allen was resistant at first, but after seeing Mort Saul on stage, he felt safer to give it a try, it never had the nerve to talk about it before. Then Mort Saul came along with a whole new style of humor, opening up vistas for people like me. Alan made his professional stage debut at the Blue Angel nightclub in Manhattan in October 1960, where comedian Shelley Berman introduced him as a young television writer who would perform his own material. His early stand-up shows with his different style of humor were not always well received or understood by his audiences. Unlike other comedians, Alan spoke to his audiences in a low-key conversational style, often a appearing to be searching for words, although his style was well rehearsed. He acted normal, dressed casually, and made no attempt to project a stage personality. And he did not improvise, I put very little premium on improvisation, he told Studs Terkel. His jokes were created from life experiences, and typically presented with a dead serious demeanor which made them funnier, I don't think my family liked me. They put a live teddy bear in my crib. The subjects of his jokes were rarely topical political or even socially relevant. Unlike Bruce and Saul, he did not discuss current events such as civil rights, women's rights, the Cold War, or Vietnam. And although he was described as a classic nebbish, he did not tell Jewish jokes. Comedy screenwriter Larry Gelbart compared Alan's style to Elaine May, he just styled himself completely after her, he said. Like Nichols and May, he often made fun of intellectuals. Television talk show host Dick Cabot, who was among the minority who quickly appreciated Alan's unique style, recalls seeing the audience at the Blue Angel mostly ignore Alan's monologue, I recognized immediately that there 
there was no young comedian in the country in the same class with him for sheer brilliance of jokes, and I resented the fact that the audience was too dumb to realize what they were getting. It was his subdued stage presence, while initially unappreciated, that eventually became one of Alan's strongest traits, explains Knackman. The utter absence of showbiz veneer and shtick was the best shtick any comedian had ever devised. This uneasy onstage naturalness became a trademark. When he was finally noticed by the media, writers like New York Times Arthur Gelb would describe Alan's nebbish quality as being Chaplin-esque and refreshing. Alan developed a neurotic, nervous, and intellectual persona for his stand-up routine, a successful move that secured regular gigs for him in nightclubs and on television. Alan brought innovation to the comedy monologue genre and his stand-up comedy would be considered influential. Alan first appeared on The Tonight Show in November 1963. He subsequently released three LP albums of live nightclub recordings, the self-titled Woody Allen, 1964, Volume 2, 1965, and the third Woody Allen album, 1968, recorded at a fundraiser for Eugene McCarthy's presidential run. The material from these albums was edited and abridged into the two LP compilation albums Stand Up Comic and Night Club Years 1964-1968, also on CD, including his The Moose Routine co-written with Mickey Rose. Allen had his own TV show beginning in 1965, called The Woody Allen Show, where he would intersperse humor with interviews of famous people, including Rev. Billy Graham and William F. Buckley, playwright. In 1966, Allen wrote the play Don't Drink the Water. The play starred Lou Jacoby, Kay Medford, Anita Gillette and Allen's future movie co-star Tony Roberts. A film adaptation of the play, directed by Howard Morris, was released in 1969, starring Jackie Gleason. Because he was not particularly happy with the 1969 film version of his play. In 1994, Alan directed and starred in a second version for television, with Michael J. Fox and Mayim Bialik. The next play Alan wrote for Broadway was Play It Again, Sam, in which he also starred. The play opened on February 12, 1969, and ran for 453 performances. It featured Diane Keaton and Roberts. The play was significant to Keaton's budding career, and she has stated she was in awe of Alan even before auditioning for her role, which was the first time she met him. During an interview in 2013, Keaton stated that she fell in love with him right away, adding, I wanted to be his girlfriend so I did something about it. After co-starring alongside Alan in the subsequent film version of Play It Again, Sam, she would later co-star in Sleeper, Love and Death, Interiors, Manhattan and Annie Hall. He showed me the ropes and I followed his lead. He is the most disciplined person I know. He works very hard, Keaton has stated. I find the same thing sexy in a man now as I always have, humor. I love it when they are funny. It's to die for. For its March 21, 1969 issue, Life featured Alan on its cover. In 1981, his play The Floating Light Bulb premiered on Broadway and ran for 65 performances. While receiving mixed reviews, it gave an autobiographical insight into Alan's childhood, specifically his fascination with magic tricks. He has written several one-act plays, including Riverside Drive and Old Saybrook exploring well-known Alan themes. On October 20, 2011, Alan's one-act play Honeymoon Motel opened as part of a larger piece entitled Relatively Speaking on Broadway with two other one-act plays, one by Ethan Cohen and one by Elaine May. Early films. His first movie was the Charles K. Feldman production What's New Pussycat? In 1965, for which he wrote the screenplay, he was disappointed with the final product, which inspired him to direct every film that he would later write. Alan's first directorial effort was What's Up, Tiger Lily, 1966, co-written with Mickey Rose, in which an existing Japanese spy movie, Kakusai Himitsu Kisitsu, Kagi no Kagi, 1965, International Secret Police, Key of Keys, was redubbed in English by Alan and Friends with fresh new, comic dialogue. In 1967, Alan played Jimmy Bond in the 007 spoof Casino Royale. Alan directed, starred in, and co-wrote, with Mickey Rose, Take the Money and Run in 1969, which received positive reviews. He later signed a deal with United Artists to produce several films. Those films eventually became Bananas, 1971, co-written with Rose, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex Asterisk, 1972, Sleeper, 1973, and Love and Death, 1975. Sleeper was the first of four films where the screenplay was co-written by Alan and Marshall Brickman. I don't like meeting heroes. There's nobody I want to meet and nobody I want to work with. I'd rather work with Diane Keaton than anyone. She's absolutely great, a natural Woody Allen. Rolling Stone Interview, 1976. In 1972, Alan wrote and starred in the film version of Play It Again, Sam. 
directed by Herbert Ross and co-starring Diane Keaton. In 1976, he starred in The Front, directed by Martin Ritt, a humorous and poignant account of Hollywood blacklisting during the 1950s. Then came two of Allen's most popular films. Annie Hall won four Academy Awards in 1977, including Best Picture, Best Actress in a Leading Role for Diane Keaton, Best Original Screenplay and Best Director for Woody Allen. Annie Hall set the standard for modern romantic comedy and ignited a fashion trend with the clothes worn by Diane Keaton in the film. In an interview with journalist Katie Couric, Keaton does not deny that Alan wrote the part for her and about her. She also explains that Alan wrote the part based on aspects of her personality at the time. Of course I recognized myself in the roles Alan wrote. I mean, in Annie Hall, 1977, particularly, I was this sort of novice who had lots of feelings but didn't know how to express herself, and I see that in Annie. I think Woody used a kind of essential quality that he found in me at that time, and I'm glad he did because it worked really well in the movie. The film is ranked at no. 35 on the American film. Film Institute 100 Best Movies and at No. 4 on the AFI list of 100 Best Comedies. Manhattan, 1979, is a black and white film often viewed as an homage to New York City. As in many Allen films, the main protagonists are upper middle class writers and academics. The love hate opinion of cerebral persons found in Manhattan is characteristic of many of Allen's movies, including Crimes and Misdemeanors and Annie Hall. Manhattan focuses on the complicated relationship between middle aged Isaac Davis, Allen, with 17 year old Tracy. Mariel Hemingway, and co-stars Diane Keaton. Keaton, who made eight movies with Alan during her career, tries to explain why his films are unique, he just has a mind like nobody else. He's bold, he's got a lot of strength, a lot of courage in terms of his work, and that is what it takes to do something really unique, along with a genius imagination. Between Annie Hall and Manhattan, Alan wrote and directed the dark drama Interiors, 1978, in the style of Swedish director Ingmar Bergman, one of Alan's chief influences. Interiors represented a departure from from Alan's early, funny comedies, a line from 1980s Stardust Memories, 1980s. Alan's 1980s films, even the comedies, have somber and philosophical undertones, with their influences being the works of European directors, specifically Ingmar Bergman and Federico Fellini. Stardust Memories was based on Eight and a Half, which it parodies, and Wild Strawberries. A Midsummer Night sex comedy was adapted from Smiles of a Summer Night, in Hannah and Her Sisters, Part of the film's structure and background is borrowed from Fanny and Alexander. A Marcord inspired Radio Days. September resembles Autumn Sonata. Alan uses many elements from Wild Strawberries. In Crimes and Misdemeanors, Alan references a scene from Wild Strawberries. Mia is a good actress who can play many different roles. She has a very good range, and can play serious to comic roles. She's also very photogenic, very beautiful on screen. She's just a good realistic actress. And no matter how strange and daring it is, she does it well. Woody Allen, 19 1993, A Midsummer Night Sex Comedy was the first of 13 movies Alan made starring Mia Farrow, who stepped into Diane Keaton's role when Keaton was shooting Reds. Stardust Memories features Sandy Bates, a successful filmmaker played by Alan, who expresses resentment and scorn for his fans. Overcome by the recent death of a friend from illness, the character states, I don't want to make funny movies anymore and a running gag has various people, including visiting space aliens, telling Bates that they appreciate his films, especially the early, funny ones. Alan believes this to be one of his best films. Alan combined tragic and comic elements in such films as Hannah and Her Sisters and Crimes and Misdemeanors, in which he tells two stories that connect at the end. He produced a vividly idiosyncratic tragic comical parody of documentary, Zelig. He also made three films about show business, Broadway Danny Rose, in which he plays a New York show business agent, The Purple Rose of Cairo, a movie that shows the importance of the cinema during the Depression through the character of the naive Cecilia, and Radio Days, a film about his childhood in Brooklyn and the importance of the radio. The film co-starred Pharaoh in a part Alan wrote specifically for her. The Purple Rose of Cairo was named by Time as one of the 100 best films of all time and Alan described it as one of his three best films, along with Stardust Memories and Match Point. Alan defines them as best not in terms of quality but because they came closest to his vision. In 1989, Alan teamed with directors Francis Ford Coppola and Martin Scorsese to make New York Stories, an anthology film about New Yorkers. Alan's short, Ed Oedipus Rex, is about a neurotic lawyer and his critical mother. His short pleased critics, but New York stories bombed at the box office. 1990s. His 1991 film Shadows and Fog is a black and white homage to the German expressionists and features the music of Kurt Weill. Alan then made his critically acclaimed drama Husbands and Wives, 1992, which received two Oscar nominations, Best Supporting Actress for Judy Davis and Best Original Screenplay for Alan. His film Manhattan Murder Mystery, 1993, combined suspense with dark comedy and marked 
the return of Diane Keaton, Alan Alda and Angelica Houston, he returned to lighter movies like Bullets Over Broadway, 1994, which earned an Academy Award nomination for Best Director, followed by a musical, Everyone Says I Love You, 1996. The singing and dancing scenes in Everyone Says I Love You are similar to musicals starring Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, the comedy Mighty Aphrodite, 1995, in which Greek drama plays a large role, won an Academy Award for Mira Sorvino, Alan's 1999 jazz-based comedy drama Sweet and Lowdown was nominated for two Academy Awards for Sean Penn, Best Actor, and Samantha Morton, Best Supporting Actress. In contrast to these lighter movies, Alan veered into darker satire towards the end of the decade with Deconstructing Harry, 1997, and Celebrity, 1998. During this decade Alan also starred in the TV movie The Sunshine Boys, 1995, based on the Neil Simon play of the same name. Alan made one sitcom appearance via telephone on the show Just Shoot Me, in a 1997 episode, My Dinner with Woody which paid tribute to several of his films. Alan provided the lead voice in the 1998 animated film Ants, which featured many actors he had worked with and Alan's character was similar to his earlier neurotic roles. 2000s, Small Time Crooks, 2000, is similar to the 1942 film Larceny, Inc., from a play by S.J. Perelman. Alan never commented on whether this was deliberate or if his film was in any way inspired by it. Small Time Crooks was Alan's first film with the DreamWorks studio and represented a change in direction, Alan began giving more interviews and made an attempt to return to his slapstick roots. The film was a relative financial success, grossing over $17 million domestically but Alan's next four films foundered at the box office, including Alan's most costly film, The Curse of the Jade Scorpion, with a budget of $26 million, Hollywood Ending, Anything Else, and Melinda and Melinda were given rotten ratings from film review website Rotten Tomatoes and each earned less than $4 million domestically. Some critics claimed that Alan's films since 1999 Sweet and Lowdown were subpar and expressed concern that Alan's best years were now behind him. Others have been less harsh, reviewing the little-liked Melinda and Melinda. Roger Ebert wrote, I cannot escape the suspicion that if Woody had never made a previous film, if each new one was Woody's Sundance debut, it would get a better reception. His reputation is not a dead shark but an albatross, which with admirable economy Alan has arranged for the critics to carry around their own necks. Woody gave his godson Quincy Rose a small part in Melinda and Melinda. Alan was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2001. Match Point, 2005, was one of Alan's most successful films of the decade, garnering positive reviews. Set in London, it starred Jonathan Rhys Myers and Scarlett Johansson. It is markedly darker than Alan's first four films with DreamWorks SKG. In Match Point, Alan shifted focus from the intellectual upper class of New York to the moneyed upper class of London. The film earned more than $23 million domestically, more than any of his films in nearly 20 years, and over $62 million in international box office sales. Match Point earned Alan his first Academy Award nomination since 1998, for Best writing, original screenplay, with directing and writing nominations at the Golden Globes, his first Globe nomination since 1987. In a 2006 interview with Premier Magazine, Alan stated this was the best film he has ever made. Alan returned to London to film Scoop, which also starred Johansson, Hugh Jackman, Ian McShane, Kevin McNally and Alan himself. The film was released on July 28, 2006, and received mixed reviews. He filmed Cassandra's Dream in London. Cassandra's Dream was released in November 2007, and stars Colin Farrell, Ewan McGregor and Tom Wilkinson. After finishing his third London film, Alan headed to Spain. He reached an agreement to film Vicky Cristina Barcelona in Avales, Barcelona and Oviedo, where shooting started on July 9, 2007. The movie stars Scarlett Johansson, Javier Bardem, Rebecca Holland Penelope Cruz. Speaking of his experience there, Alan said, I'm delighted at being able to work with MediaPro and make a film in Spain, a country which has become so special to me. Vicky Cristina Barcelona was well received, winning Best Motion Picture, Musical or Comedy at the Golden Globe Awards. Penelope Cruz received the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for her role in the film. Alan has said that he survives on the European market. Audiences there tend to be more receptive to his films, particularly in Spain, France and Italy, countries where he has a large audience, joked about in Hollywood ending. In the United States things have changed a lot, and it's hard to make good small films now, Alan said in a 2004 interview. The avaricious studios couldn't care less about good films, if they get a good film they're twice as happy but money-making films are their goal. They only want these $100 million pictures that make $500 million. In April 2008, he began filming a story focused more towards older audiences starring Larry David. Thank you.
Patricia Clarkson and Evan Rachel Wood, released in 2009, Whatever Works, described as a dark comedy, follows the story of a botched suicide attempt turned messy love triangle. Whatever Works was written by Alan in the 1970s and the character played by Larry David was written for Zero Mostel, who died the year Annie Hall came out. 2010s You Will Meet a Tall Dark Stranger, filmed in London, stars Antonio Banderas, Josh Brolin, Anthony Hopkins, Anupam Kerr, Frida Pinto and Naomi Watts. Filming started in July 2000. 2009. It was released theatrically in the U.S. on September 23, 2010, following a can debut in May 2010, and a screening at the Toronto International Film Festival on September 12, 2010. Alan announced that his next film would be titled Midnight in Paris, starring Adrian Brody, Owen Wilson, Marion Cotillard, Rachel McAdams, Kathy Bates, Michael Sheen. Gad Elmala and Carla Bruni, the First Lady of France at the time of production. The film follows a young engaged couple in Paris who see their lives transformed. It debuted at the 2011 Cannes Film Festival on May 12, 2011. Alan said he wanted to show the city emotionally. During the press conference, I just wanted it to be the way I saw Paris. Paris through my eyes, he added. Critically acclaimed, the film was considered by some a mark for his return to form. Midnight in Paris won the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay. His next film, To Rome with Love, was a Rome set comedy released in 2012. The film was structured in four vignettes featuring dialogue in both Italian and English. It marked Alan's return to acting since his last role in Scoop. Blue Jasmine debuted in July 2013. The film is set in San Francisco and New York, and stars Alec Baldwin, Kate Blanchett, Louis C.K., Andrew Dice Clay, Sally Hawkins, and Peter Sarsgaard. Opened to critical acclaim, the film earned Alan another Academy Award nomination for Best Original Screenplay, and Blanchett went to receive the Academy Award for Best Actress. In 2013, in Nice, France, Alan shot the romantic comedy Magic in the Moonlight, set in the 1920s on the French Riviera and starring Colin Firth and Emma Stone. Alan co-stars with John Turturro in Fading Gigolo, written and directed by Turturro, which premiered in September 20. 13. From July through August 2014, Alan filmed the mystery drama Irrational Man in Newport, Rhode Island, with Joaquin Phoenix, Emma Stone, Parker Posey and Jamie Blackley. Alan said that this film, as well as the next three he has planned, have financing and the full support of Sony Pictures Classics. Alan has filmed his next film, an untitled period comedy drama starring an ensemble cast that includes Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart. Bruce Willis was set to co-star, but was replaced by Steve Carell during filming. Future projects. For many years, Alan wanted to make a film about the origins of jazz in New Orleans. The film, tentatively titled American Blues, would follow the vast different careers of Louis Armstrong and Sidney Betchett. Allen stated that the film would cost between $80 and $100 million and is therefore unlikely to be made. On January 14, 2015, it was announced Allen will write and direct a half-hour television series for Amazon Studios, marking the first time he has developed a television show. It will be available exclusively on Amazon Prime Instant Video, and Amazon Studios has already ordered a full season. Allen said of the series, I don't know how I got into this. I have no ideas and I I'm not sure where to begin. My guess is that Roy Price will regret this, a reference to Price, the head of Amazon Studios. At the 2015 Cannes Film Festival, Alan said, in reference to his upcoming Amazon show, it was a catastrophic mistake. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm floundering. I expect this to be a cosmic embarrassment. On January 25, 2016, Alan was confirmed to be starring in the series Alongus de Elaine May and Miley Cyrus. Theater. While best known for his films, Alan has enjoyed a successful career in theater, starting as early as 1960, when he wrote sketches for the review from A to Z. His first great success was Don't Drink the Water, which opened in 1968, and ran for 598 performances for almost two years on Broadway. His success continued with Play It Again, Sam, which opened in 1969, starring Alan and Diane Keaton. The show played for 453 performances and was nominated for three Tony Awards, although none of the nominations were for Alan's writing or acting. In the 1970s, Alan wrote a number of one-act plays, most notably God and Death, which were published in his 1975 collection Without Feathers. In 1981, Allen's play The Floating Light Bulb opened on Broadway. The play was a critical success and a commercial flop. Despite two Tony Award nominations, a Tony win for the acting of Brian Backer, who won the 1981 Theatre World Award and a Drama Desk Award for his work, the play only ran for 62 performances. After a long hiatus from the stage, Allen returned to the theatre in 1995, with the one-act Central Park West 
Ghost, an installment in an evening of theater known as Death Defying Acts that was also made up of new work by David Mamet and Elaine May. For the next few years, Allen had no direct involvement with the stage, yet notable productions of his work were staged. A production of God was staged at the Bank of Brazil Cultural Center in Rio de Janeiro, and theatrical adaptations of Allen's films Bullets Over Broadway and September were produced in Italy and France, respectively, without Allen's involvement. In 1997, rumors of Allen returning to the theater to write a starring role for his wife Soon Yi Previn turned out to be false. In 2003, Allen finally returned to the stage with Writer's Block, an evening of two one-acts, Old Saybrook and Riverside Drive, that played off-Broadway. The production marked the stage directing debut for Allen. The production sold out the entire run. Also in 2003, reports of Allen writing the book for a musical based on bullets over Broadway surfaced, and it opened in New York in 2014. The musical closed on August 24, 2014, after 156 performances and 33 previews. In 2004, Allen's first full-length play since 1981, A Second Hand Memory, was directed by Allen and enjoyed an extended run off-Broadway. In June 2007, it was announced that Allen would make two more creative debuts in the theater, directing a work that he did not write and directing an opera, a reinterpretation of Puccini's Johnny Shiki for the Los Angeles Opera, which debuted at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion on September 6, 2008. Commenting on his direction of the opera, Allen said, I have no idea what I'm doing. His production of the opera opened the Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, Italy, in June 2009. In October 2011, Woody Allen's one-act play called Honeymoon Motel premiered as one in a series of one-act plays on Broadway titled Relatively Speaking. Also contributing to the plays are Elaine May and Ethan Cohen with John Turturro directing. It was announced in February 2012 that Allen would adapt Bullets over Broadway into a Broadway musical. It opened on April 10, 2014 and closed on August 24, 2014. Music Allen is a passionate fan of jazz, featured prominently in the soundtracks to his films. He began playing the clarinet as a child and took his stage name from clarinetist Woody Herman. He has performed publicly at least since the late 1960s, notably with the Preservation Hall Jazz Band on the soundtrack of Sleeper. One of his earliest televised performances was on the Dick Cavett Show on October 20, 1971. Woody Allen and his New Orleans Jazz Band have been playing each Monday evening at Manhattan's Carlisle Hotel for many years. As of 2011, specializing in classic New Orleans jazz from the early 20th century, he plays songs by Sidney Bechet, George Lewis, Johnny Dodds, Jimmy No One and Louis Armstrong. The documentary film Wild Man Blues, directed by Barbara Koppel, documents a 1996 European tour by Allen and his band, as well as his relationship with Previn. The band has released two CDs, The Bunk Project, 1993, and The Soundtrack of Wild Man Blues, 1997. In a 2011 review of a concert by Allen's jazz band, critic Kirk Silsby of the LA Times suggested that Allen should be regarded as a competent musical hobbyist with a sincere appreciation for early jazz. Allen's clarinet won't make anyone forget Sidney Bechet, Barney Biggert or Evan Christopher. His piping tone and strings of staccato notes can't approximate melodic or lyrical phrasing. Still his earnestness and the obvious regard he has for traditional jazz counts for something. Allen and his band played the Montreal International Jazz Festival on two consecutive nights in June 2008. Works about Allen. Apart from Wild Man Blues, directed by Barbara Koppel, there are other documentaries featuring Woody Allen, including the 2002 cable television documentary Woody Allen, A Life in Film, directed by Time film critic Richard Schickel, which interlaces interviews of Allen with clips of his films, and Meaden, Wa, a short interview of Allen by French director Jean-Luc Godard. In 2011 the PBS series American Masters co-produced a comprehensive documentary about him, Woody Allen, a documentary directed by Robert B. Whitey. Eric LAX authored the book Woody Allen, a biography. From 1976 to 1984, Stuart Hample wrote and drew inside Woody Allen, a comic strip based on Allen's film persona, personal life, marriages and romantic relationships. Allen has had three wives, Harleen Rosen, 1954-1959, Louise Lasser, 1966-1970, and Soon Yi Previn, 1997-present. Though he had a 12-year romantic relationship with actress Mia Farrow, the two never married. Allen also had romantic relationships with Stacey Nelkin and Diane Keaton. Harleen Rosen, at age 19, Allen married 16-year-old Harleen Rosen. The marriage lasted from 1954-1959. to 
Time stated that the years were nettling and unsettling. Rosen, whom Allen referred to in his stand-up act as the Dread Mrs. Allen, sued him for defamation due to comments at a TV appearance shortly after their divorce. Allen tells a different story on his mid-1960s stand-up album Stand-Up Comic. In his act, Allen said that Rosen sued him because of a joke he made in an interview. Rosen had been sexually assaulted outside her apartment and according to Allen, the newspapers reported that she had been violated. In the interview, Allen said, knowing my ex-wife, it probably wasn't a moving violation. In an interview on the Dick Cabot show, Allen brought up the incident again where he repeated his comments and stated that the sum for which he was sued was $1 million. Louise Lasser Allen married Louise Lasser in 1966. They divorced in 1970, and Allen did not marry again until 1997. Lasser appeared in three Allen films shortly after the divorce, Take the Money and Run, Bananas, and Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex Asterisk, Asterisk But Were Afraid to Ask, and later briefly appeared in Stardust Memories. Diane Keaton In 1970, Allen cast Diane Keaton in his Broadway show, Play It Again, Sam. During the run she and Allen became romantically involved and although they broke up after a year, she continued to star in a number of his films, including Sleeper as a futuristic poet and Love and Death as a composite character based on the novels of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Annie Hall was very important in Allen and Keaton's careers. It is said that the role was written for her, as Diane Keaton's birth name was Diane Hall. She then starred in Interiors as a poet, followed by Manhattan. In 1987, she had a cameo as a nightclub singer in Radio Day and was chosen to replace Mia Farrow in the co-starring role for Manhattan Murder Mystery after Alan and Farrow began having troubles with their personal and working relationship while making this film. Keaton has not worked with Alan since Manhattan Murder Mystery. Since the end of their romantic relationship, Keaton and Allen remain close friends. Stacy Nelkin The film Manhattan is said by the Los Angeles Times to be widely known to have been based on his romantic relationship with actress Stacy Nelkin. Her bit part in Annie Hall ended up on the cutting room floor, and their relationship, though never publicly acknowledged by Allen, reportedly began when she was 17, and a student at New York's Stuyvesant High School. Mia Farrow Around 1980, Allen began a 10-year relationship with actress Mia Farrow, who starred in 13 of his films from 1982 to 1990. They never married or lived together, but lived near one another on opposite sides of Central Park in Manhattan. In December 1991, after 10 years together, Alan formally adopted two of Pharaoh's own previously adopted children. Dylan, 7, and Moses, 13. Farrow told the court that Alan was an excellent father, although the children lived with her. The New York Times wrote that Alan and Farrow are constantly in touch with each other, and not many fathers spend as much time with their children as Alan does. He tried to be with them every day. The following month, January 1992, Farrow was at Alan's home and came across nude photos of her other adopted daughter, 21-year-old Soon Yi Previn, which were taken by Alan. As a result, Farrow realized that Alan was having an affair with Soon Yi. This caused a bitter breakup of the long-term relationship between Alan and Pharaoh, with Soon Yi then moving in with Alan. In her autobiography, What Falls Away, Pharaoh says that Alan admitted to the relationship with Soon Yi. Soon Yi Previn. Soon Yi Previn was the adopted daughter of Pharaoh and her former husband, composer Andre Previn. Soon Yi, who was born in Korea, was a child when her mother abandoned her by leaving her on a street in the slums of Seoul. Pharaoh adopted her at age seven. Because Alan and Pharaoh had never married, Alan was not Previn's legal stepfather. After his relationship with Mia Farrow ended acrimoniously in 1992. Alan and Previn continued their relationship and she moved in with Alan. They married in 1997 and have two adopted daughters. Children. Alan and Mia Farrow, though unmarried, jointly adopted two children. Dylan Farrow, who changed her name to Eliza and later to Malone, and Moshe Farrow, known as Moses, they also had one biological child, Satchel Farrow, known as Ronan. Ronan's paternity came into question, however, after Farrow claimed in 2013 that he might in fact be the biological child of Frank Sinatra, her first husband, with whom she never really split up, she said, Alan did not adopt any of Farrow's other children, including Soon Yi. Following Alan's separation from Farrow, and after a bitter custody battle, she won custody of their children. Alan was denied visitation rights with Malone and could see Ronan only under supervision. Moses, who was then 15, chose not to see Alan but by age 36 he had become estranged from his mother and re-established his relationship with Alan and his sister. Pharaoh tried to have Alan's two adoptions with her nullified, but the court decided in Alan's favor and he continues to be their legal father. Allegations of child sexual abuse. Alan and Pharaoh engaged in a heated and emotionally damaging custody battle after they broke up in January 1992. That August, Alan visited his children at Pharaoh's home while she went shopping so they wouldn't have to see one another. Pharaoh later accused him of having molested their seven-year-old daughter, Dylan, 
During that visit, and filed charges with the police, Dylan said that the abuse took place in the attic. However, Moses Farrow, Dylan's older brother, then 15, said there were several people present in the house during Alan's entire visit and no one, not my father or sister, was off in any private spaces. The case was dropped in 1993 after a seven-month probe by a police-appointed medical team concluded that Dylan had not been molested. Among the reasons cited for the team's conclusion were the contradictory statements made by Dylan and that her statements had a rehearsed quality. The judge eventually found that the sex abuse charges were inconclusive. In addition, investigators with the New York Department of Social Services closed their own 14-month investigation after their similar conclusion, that no credible evidence was found that the child named in this report has been abused or maltreated. Allen was interviewed by 60 Minutes a few months following the allegations, when he described the custody battle, heated exchanges, and the allegations. In February 2014, Dylan Farrow repeated the allegations in an open letter published by Nicholas Christoph, a friend of Farrow, in his New York Times blog. Allen again repeated his denial of the allegations, calling them untrue and disgraceful, and followed with his own response in the New York Times. Dylan's brother, Moses, currently a family therapist, told People magazine, of course Woody did not molest my sister. She loved him and looked forward to seeing him when he would visit. He said that their mother had manipulated her children into hating Alan as a vengeful way to pay him back for falling in love with Soon Yi. Dylan has denied that she was ever coached by her mother and has stood by her allegations. Psychoanalysis. Alan spent over 37 years undergoing psychoanalysis, and some of his films, such as Annie Hall, jokingly include references to psychoanalysis. Moment magazine magazine says, it drove his self-absorbed work. Alan's biographer John Baxter, wrote, Alan obviously found analysis stimulating, even exciting. Alan says his psychoanalysis ended around the time he began his relationship with Previn, although he is still claustrophobic and agoraphobic. Alan has described himself as being a militant Freudian atheist. Theatrical works. In addition to directing, writing, and acting in films, Alan has written and performed in a number of Broadway theater productions. Filmography.